Well, good afternoon or good morning, wherever you might be. Uh, this is Don Grossman, Technology Advancement Manager, also entomologist for the company. Uh, today I'm going to talk about uh, scale insects and uh, as an outline we'll uh, talk, I'll present a few facts and uh, then get into the life cycle of scales, some of the different types of scales, the damage that they cause, and then of course management of scales on various trees. Uh, I'll even mention uh, the results of a recent research trial that we conducted with some of our products. So, uh, scales are uh, members of the order Hemiptera. These are piercing, sucking insects that also include aphids, white flies, and others. Um, they uh, are quite numerous, um, uh, at least 8,000 described species. Um, they get their names from the uh, scale or shell-like waxy coating that conceals their bodies. Um, they range in size from a pretty small eighth of an inch to about a half an inch in size. Uh, various colors, shapes, textures, um, and uh, the, these insects are sexually dimorphic, meaning that they have, uh, the males and females have different shapes or forms. Uh, the females uh, kind of remain immature in their immature uh, shape, uh, through, even though they're sexually mature. The males, however, will uh, molt into winged um, gnat-like uh, forms, and uh, the females stay put once they settle into uh, a plant, whereas the males will eventually um, emerge to fly and find, find females. Uh, the first instars of scales once they hatch from their eggs, are called crawlers. They have functional legs that allow them to crawl around looking for a favorable place to settle down and feed. Um, there's many, many different scale species, and they pretty much all trees, shrubs, ornamentals, even um, uh, organic or um, agricultural crops are uh, attacked by scale insects. Um, they're, they're important because uh, they can, as a result of their feeding, they can weaken trees and shrubs. And although the mortality of the plant is rare, uh, they can predispose uh, these hosts to other insect disease issues or problems. Uh, kind of moving to the reproduction, um, the eggs are laid underneath their shell and um, upwards of 2,000 eggs can be laid, as you can see in that upper right hand uh, picture. And uh, the, the hard scales, and I'll, I'll get into the hard and soft scales in a little bit, but the hard scales can reproduce either sexually after mating or asexually if uh, they don't find a mate. And uh, usually asexually they'll be producing um, more males and eventually, uh, eventually females. Sexually, uh, apparently the uh, sex ratio is, is largely to the female, but there are a fair, fairly large number of males produced. Uh, the eggs, as I mentioned, hatch into crawlers, 
and they can be quite variable in size and shape and color as indicated uh, in the lower right corner. Uh, this uh, provides a, an illustration of the general life cycle of scales. Um, if you look at, can this, can this? They can. They can see that. Okay. Using the pointer, you, you start with the female who lays eggs, producing crawlers, and uh, they will settle into areas, and depending on their sex, will. Uh, molt into males or females, and uh, you can uh, see from the picture, the above picture, that uh, these are the the males, and then again the females kind of remain in an immature stage. This is perhaps a little better illustration showing the Jose scale with the uh, initial crawler molting into um, similar first molt and then uh, subsequently uh, shifting into either male or female stage. And then uh, in this case, there's two generations per year. Uh, as I kind of indicated, there are two different types of scales. Um, each in a different family. One is referred to as soft scales and the other, of course, hard scales. And here I have listed some of the different characteristics of each of the groups. And uh, soft scales having one generation per year. These this group produces honeydew, which can be problematic and I'll talk about a little bit later. Uh, they overwinter as immature fertilized females. They generally have a, a convex shape and resemble helmets. The protective wall is attached to the body um, and uh, the crawlers are quite active. In contrast, uh, hard scales have two or more generations per year. They do not produce honeydew. Uh, they generally overwinter as eggs underneath the, the body of the, the female. They're circular or oyster shaped. Um, the crawlers tend to be less active. And the covering over the, the body is actually separate from the body in contrast to the soft scale. Uh, a little bit more about soft scales. These, this group Members are, are generally a little larger than the other one. Again, the covering is attached to the body and kind of soft, as the name implies. Uh, when they feed, they produce a large amount of honeydew, which results in often uh, in sooty mold uh, situations. The female lays quite a large number of eggs, and uh, they're uh, capable of reducing the tree's vigor, um, not just as a result of their feeding, but because of the presence of sooty mold blocking photosynthesis of the leaves. Uh, these, this group is generally easier to manage compared to armored or hard scales. This is a list of some of the more common soft scales that might be found in the landscape areas. Um, I've worked to a certain extent with the European Elm scale in Colorado, and I'll talk about a research trial that we conducted uh, in a few minutes. But uh, some of the, again, some of the different uh, members, and you can see that the general shape and texture of the scales is kind of soft and rounded and helmet shaped. Uh, hard or armored scales, again they have a, a shield like cover that's separate from the body uh, and is created as a result of shed skin and wax that they produce. Uh, they're generally smaller, about an eighth of an inch in diameter 
uh, instead of feeding on uh, the plant sap, they have a tendency to pierce individual plant cells, rupturing them, and then suck out the contents. So they're, they feed in a different fashion compared to the soft scales. Uh, as a result, these, this group of insects is more difficult to manage because they're not uh, tapping into the vascular system like the soft scales are. And here's a, a short list of some of the more common hard scales found in the landscape. So probably the, some of the more common ones are oyster shell scales, euonymus scales, uh, pine needle scales. Uh, again, they're pretty small, uh, kind of oval in shape, sometimes round, pretty small. So the damage that they cause, as I've kind of alluded to, is that uh, they, they're uh, inserting their mouth parts, sucking mouth parts into the plant and drawing plant fluids in the case of soft scales and then in the hard scales where they're rupturing plant cells and extracting uh, the, the contents of those cells. So uh, soft scales will Again, produce honey dew, which, when released, uh, will drop from the trees or shrubs, and that medium is uh, uh, used by uh, sooty mold fungi to create the sooty mold um, black situation. Uh, so this honey dew is sticky. Um, landing on parked cars and benches, uh, creating a, a sticky mess. Uh, the sugary liquid is quite attractive to ants, flies, and wasps, so um, could be annoying and or dangerous relative to wasps. Um, and uh, this uh, kind of illustrates some of the issues relating to honeydew and sooty mold. Uh, resulting from the feeding of scales. Um, the mold is not actually infecting the situation. It's, it's more of, a, of an effect of the honeydew that they're growing on this nutrient uh, material. Uh, the sooty mold also, when landing on and produced on leaves, reduces photosynthesis uh, of the plant and causing stress and uh, may, may make the, the plants or trees more susceptible to other uh, insect or disease problems. Uh, like I said, uh, hard scales use their mouth parts to penetrate and rupture plant cells and feed on their contents. Um, as a result, You'll see yellowing or wilting of leaves. Sometimes uh, it'll stunt the growth of plants, but like I indicated before, it rarely kills plants, but makes them more susceptible to other injuries, such as drought, winter, severe winters, or attack by insects and disease. Uh, there are reported cases where some scales will actually inject saliva that may be toxic to plants. Um, can't give you an example offhand, uh, except to say that it's, it's not too common. Um, in certain cases, like with beach scale on American beach, uh, these insects create wound sites that allow uh, access by certain fungi. Uh, in the case of beech bark disease, this is a ne neonectria fungus that uh, finds access into the tree via these wound sites that the scales produce. So um, uh, there's also a newer 
situation with white pine and the scale that is found on that that tree and uh, we're seeing dieback and tree mortality as a result of a, an associated fungus and at least for now the, the hypothesis is that this scale is also providing wound access points for the fungus to get into the tree. So. Regarding management, uh, I kind of alluded to the fact that soft scales can be fairly easy to control while hard scales are more difficult. Um, for both, uh, they uh, control can be somewhat difficult because they're covered by this waxy, cottony cover that uh, is a barrier to contact insecticides. They're stationary, so they're not moving into the material, so the, that cover will protect them and, uh, and not cause mortality. Um, there are really three areas of management that can be performed. One is cultural, biological, or insecticide use. Um, at least uh, anybody who is trying to manage scales should try to look for uh, at least initially co cultural or biological control options before considering chemical options. Um, you can uh, select the right tree. You're trying to keep the plants healthy, thus making them less susceptible, less stressed uh, to, to scale infestation. Um, if you regularly check the plants and uh, only manage when populations begin to build, then uh, the, the situation shouldn't grow to an emergency situation. In some cases where high populations are occurring on individual branches, it may be uh, worthwhile to prune out these branches, thus reducing the overall population on the, the tree or uh, shrub. These scales, most of these scales are native to the United States. There are a few um, exotics, but frequently uh, there are a large number of beneficial insects, natural enemies that uh, are known to feed on scales and or crawlers. They include lady beetles, lace wings, and there's a large number of parasitic wasps. So uh, if there are many of these natural enemies, uh, it would be ill-advised to apply any type of insecticide. Uh, obviously, these, these native, natural enemies are going to be susceptible to the, the toxin as well. So try to let nature take care of itself, at least initially, um, unless the, the populations uh, explode. Uh, in a way of keeping um, plants healthy, we, we do have a product called NutriRoot, and uh, this is uh, primarily used for water management as well as trying to promote root growth. By, uh, through this, we can reduce drought stress, we can improve transplant success. Uh, the product will promote root growth. And address, and address nutrient deficiencies. So this is a, a cultural technique for keeping the, the plants or trees healthy and thus uh, maybe be more resistant to insect uh, infestation like scales. If uh, the cultural controls are, are not uh, sufficient or the natural enemy populations are fairly low and not exerting uh, enough uh, pressure on the scale populations, it may be necessary to use uh, chemical control options. Uh, 
talk a little bit about some of the three different uh, product groups, uh, dormant oils, contact insecticides, or systemic insecticides. Um, dormant oils can be applied um, as, uh, when the plant is dormant, usually early in the spring or perhaps um, a little later in the, in the summer. Uh, these oils will actually suffocate the scales and uh, so they're not necessarily a contact poison, they're more, uh, again, suffocating them, covering them, and preventing uh, uh, survival. We do, uh, uh, there are a number of different dormant oils out there. Uh, we do have a product called Ecomite Plus, which contains natural uh, oils, including rosemary, peppermint, cottonseed oils. And, and, and similar to the dormant oil, these, these uh, active or oil, um, natural oils will serve to suffocate the scales and reduce populations. Um, it's just uh, so it is. A, these are natural oils, so they uh, are listed as 25B products. Um, there's no when applied. There is no burning like you might see for some of the other uh, dormant oils. Um, you can apply it as a foliar spray, and. Uh, in many different situations can provide control of scales. Um, where, where necessary, there, there's, uh, you have the option of spraying contact insecticides. Um, again, upon application, uh, the, if you're treating when the adults are present, it, your, the effectiveness of the treatment may not be very good because, again, they are covered by these uh, coverings or scales which protect them against uh, insecticides. So ideally, you should be targeting the crawler stage early on after egg emergence. Uh, I've listed uh, several different active ingredients that are labeled for scale control, including bifenthrin, cyfluthrin, deltamethrin, landocyalithrin, and malathion. Uh, there are some limitations uh, for use of these contact insecticides, such as, as I kind of alluded to, timing is critical. You have to target certain the, uh, the crawler stage and knowing when those crawlers are present uh, may be difficult. Uh, getting full coverage of the insecticide on the large trees can be difficult. And as I mentioned before, we need to be careful about beneficials that might be um, uh, parasitic or predators of scales. And by applying these contact poisons can uh, significantly reduce beneficial populations. An all alternative to regular contact insecticides is uh, bio-rational products that may include azadiractin. And Arborjet has a product called Azasol, which is uh, water, very water soluble and can be applied um, either as a spray, a soil drench, or actual tree injection. This is a, a natural uh, product um, extracted from the neem tree. It's um, OMRI listed, has no smell or, or unpleasant oily residue like some products do. Um, if applied to a food crop, there's um, the re-entry interval is uh, zero days. So again, very safe product and quite effective against 
scales, particularly soft scales. This uh, provides a list of uh, times that should be considered when trying to treat for some of these different soft and hard scales. These uh, periods are, are to target the crawler stage. So European elm scale, should you should be treating in early April. And then, of course, you can see the, the other scales may vary depending on when the crawlers are present. Uh, instead of contact poisons or insecticides, you may want to consider systemic insecticides. Uh, a systemic insecticide is one that is water soluble and is actively taken up by plants or, or trees and transported within the plant to different target areas that might be uh, infested with scale. Uh, the most systemics move within the vascular tissue. Most are found or transported within the xylem tissue, the water conductive tissue. Some are moved or can move within the phloem tissue, but there's only a few few active ingredients that are capable of doing that, such as amamectin benzoate. Um, Systemics are, are very active or effective against piercing, sucking insects, uh, including soft scales, as, uh, particularly because they feed within the vascular plant tissues. So the chemicals are present in those layers uh, where the, the insect is drawing plant fluids. Another similar type of systemic is, is, are certain products that are referred to as translaminar. This is where it's, it's locally systemic. It's not actually moved within the vascular system. It may move through a few layers, uh, surface layers of cells. And so when the insect feeds or in those areas, they may take up some of the products. Uh, there's several methods of application for both contact and systemic insecticides. Uh, spray applications either to the foliage or to the bark is possible. There's also soil drenching or injection and then an actual tree injection into the vascular system. Spray applications in trenches can be effective, but there's also several limitations that need to be considered. Uh, spray applications are, are dictated by the weather. Uh, sometimes overspray is common. As a result, you have drift and non-target effects. Uh, it's di sometimes difficult to get full coverage, particularly on large trees. Um, with bark, basal bark sprays, uh, the systemic actually moves through the bark, kind of acting as a translaminar movement, but eventually the, the, some of these systemics actually move into the vascular system. Uh, probably the biggest pr problem with basal bark sprays is large trees with very thick bark can reduce the movement of the chemical into the tree. And so large trees, old trees with thick bark, uh, may, you may not see as good effects as you would on, on smaller trees. Uh, soil drenches uh, are been shown to be effective, but you're putting a large amount of product into the soil. Sometimes if the product is very water soluble, it may leach from the soil into water systems, which obviously is a big concern. Uh, again, you're putting a large amount of product into the soil and not all of it moves into the tree. So there may be off-target effects 
And uh, again, it may be, the effects may be limited, particularly in larger trees. With tree injection, uh, we at ArborJet feel that we're, this is a more responsible way of treating trees. Uh, you, all the product is applied and is in the, the tree itself. We see quick, very rapid response to the, the treatments. There's very little, if any, off-target effects because the chemicals within the tree, the only thing that comes in contact with it is insects that are actually feeding within or on the, the trees. And all the product goes into the trees, so there is no waste of product. Um, so I've kind of mentioned a few reasons why you should, we feel that you should inject rather than spray or drench. All the product stays in the tree, very minimal impact to soil, water, and air. There's no exposure to the public and very minimal to the applicator. Most of our systems are closed, so very little chance of contact to the chemical. Uh, we can apply systemics in public locations where um, the Ordinarily, in a spray or drench situation, there might be exposure issues. As a result of the fact that we are putting everything into the tree, um, the residual effects are quite long. Uh, there's no photo or microbial degradation of the, the chemical outside, like we see outside the tree. Um, Again, the treatment only affects pests that are actually feeding on the tree. We feel that tree injection is truly the, the best integrated pest management option available. And unlike sprays and drenches, uh, tree injection is not affected by um, weather and other issues. Um, so for soft scales, we are recommending one of three different product applications, uh, either Imajet, Acejet, or Azosol. Uh, like contact uh, sprays, we're targeting the crawlers, so applications should be within a short period of time before the, the crawlers emerge. Imajet is a uh, well-known systemic and known to be effective against soft scales for most species. Under a few instances, actually, there, as a result of spray applications or soil drenches, um, there are some resistance being developed in a few instances, but uh, for the most part, it, imidacloprid is quite effective against um, most soft scale uh, infestations. Uh, ACE jet is another option. ACE jet is uh, the active ingredient in is acephate. It's a very water soluble, fast acting insecticide. Uh, in contrast to imidacloprid, acephate is rather short lived. And we, we generally refer to it as our 911. When populations of pests are, are very high, you want to knock down the population quickly. Acephate is the go-to uh, for, for that situation. Um, normally, upon application, the effects are within days, if not hours, uh, but the the effects eventually fade out within about 30 to 60 days, more probably closer to 30 days, but sometimes 60 days. Um, and again, very, very effective, not, not only for soft scales, but also for hard scales. I made mention of a, a research trial that we conducted. Uh, this is, was for European elm scale. For this particular insect in Colorado, 
they've seen a, a fair amount of resistance developing against uh, Im imidacloprid. So we're looking at some alternatives, including the use of acephate alone or in combination with uh, azadiractin or azosol. And you see that uh, in 2016, the infestation levels were very similar across all treatments. After application, 12 months later, we came back and uh, populations were very low, if non-existent, for several of the treatments, including the ACEJET alone or in combination with the azosol, as well as the azosol mid and high range treatment. You see that imidacloprid did reduce populations significantly, but not nearly to the extent that you see for the uh, ACEJET and azosol. And then two years after application, we see that the combination azosol plus ACEJET is still significantly lower compared to the untreated checks. So we, we're seeing two-year effects. Um, the other treatments, ACEJET as well as the um, azosol alone, are start, the populations are starting to recover though the high level of azosol is still pretty pretty low. So we're, we're con continuing to monitor this trial, uh, but it's looking very favorable to use a combination of ACEJET and azosol as a way of knocking down populations quickly, and then the azadiractin will keep populations low. Azadiractin is a insect growth regulator as well as a uh, anti -feedin. So it's not, there's no immediate effect, there's no immediate mortality caused by it. It disrupts both feeding as well as the reproductive cycle of the insects. So it takes some time for populations to respond to these, the azosol uh, alone. Armored scale Treatments uh, kind of alluded to, they're, they're more difficult than soft scales. Uh, you need to target the crawlers, like I've indicated before. Dormant oils do not tend to be very effective, particularly for um, the overwintering eggs. So you need to target the crawlers once they emerge. Um, again, they, these, this group of hard scales have multiple generations per year, so you have to be aware of when these crawlers are, are present to be able to get good control. Um, we know that imidacloprid does not tend to work very well against hard scales. Uh, there may be some limited effects, but not nearly to the extent that uh, you generally hope to see. In contrast, we, we do see good effects using ACEJET um, or acephate as a quick knockdown. And then again, we, we expect to see uh, good effects using azadiractin as a way of uh, disrupting the reproductive cycle of this insect. And uh, the effect should last for well over a year if, if applied at the right time. So that's largely it. Um, I hope uh, you were able to get something out of it. Uh, I certainly did as a result of putting this talk together. Um, it, here's my contact information. If you have any questions at a later date, feel free to give me a call or send me an email. Be happy to help you out where I can. All Thank right. You. Thank you, Dr. Don. Uh, appreciate you taking the time to put together the presentation and all the data that you do to ga uh, all you do to gather the data.